Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, another very interesting show. And uh, today I have my special guest back on, Jeffrey Nyquist. Jeff, welcome to the show again. Oh, thanks for having me. It's it's great to have you. Now, when we we see that that like we discussed earlier that we are in a very critical situation at this very moment. And, and you described it to me before we, we started the show that maybe we're heading towards a war. So I want to get your take on how you are viewing the geopolitical situation and also with this coronavirus spread. Please, Jeff. Yeah, the big question is, is whether we're at the beginnings of a, of a war, of a larger conflict. And it, uh, there's many signs that we're headed into a major conflict. On the 27th, the U.S. called up a million reservists. This is a definite pre-war move, but even more alarming, the essential staff of the Pentagon for running the military uh, went to bunkers in uh, Colorado, 2,000 feet deep bunkers. These aren't antivirus bunkers. These are bunkers that can withstand a nuclear attack. So this is very interesting. Um, I talked to a, uh, a former uh, defense intelligence analyst, military analyst in Washington this past week. And uh, the way he read it was, uh, we are under biological attack from China. But whether that virus got out intentionally or not, they used Wuhan as a Petri dish just before the Chinese holiday. They let the virus get out to the rest of the world and they are following it up as if it's an attack. We're uh, catching people coming into the country, Chinese nationals, bringing viruses with them, bringing things with them. We've had, uh, we've had some very peculiar things on our um, people having videos from stores of uh -huh. Chinese people touching items with their hands, uh -huh. of spitting on produce. I mean, I don't know how many of these videos of Chinese spitting on produce I've seen this past week. This is, um, you know, very alarming because, you know, stores have cameras for shoplifting and stuff. Stores have cameras and these cameras are picking up this activity. And these people, you know, they're, they're Asians. They're not Europeans. They're not black people. They're Asians. They look Chinese. And they're, you see them clearly. They're spitting. They're putting their hands on things. And, and people are even, there's one video where the lady's in a computer store. She's, she's touching all the keyboards. She's running her hands over all the keyboards in this person challenges they're like what are you doing why are you doing that you know exactly um, no i seen i seen those i seen i seen those footages and i also seen where where they produce these masks you know and a chinese you know he he stomps on them with his you know dirty shoes and so on it's totally disgusting and they left you know so obviously we see that there is a sabotage from from the chinese that they're you know, just they want this to spread, and 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 then you may, and this raises a, a flag, a red flag. Why are they doing this if they, you know, you know, if they if they have no bad intentions? So absolutely. Yeah, and there's the other issue. This is a very strange thing. China closed its border from people coming into China, mm -hmm. which is a very strange action. Nobody's going to allow be allowed to come into China, and Russia followed suit some days ago. So you have these two giant military powers, which they are really big. China and Russia has the most nuclear weapons and most missiles, strategic missiles on the planet, and China has the biggest military on the planet. They've got a larger military system than the U.S. So you have these two tremendous powers, whose combined navies outnumber the U.S. Navy by almost two to one. And in terms of number of, of, of surface combatants and ships and so on, not not our aircraft carrier groups are better in terms of, uh, you know, conventional warfare. But we don't really know how if you put nukes on missiles on uh, uh, tactical ship missiles, we don't really know how it would play out in real life. Um, so anyway, so you have this this these two countries closing their borders and the, the immediate thing that a military analyst thinks is. Are they going to hit us with a worse biological iteration of this virus? Something that's been prepared in advance that maybe has a lethality between 30 and 60 percent that has been prepared that they don't want blowing back on them. That is, since the thing is contagious, they close their borders so they can't get it. Uh -huh. 
and that that's what they're they're contemplating because this is a very strange no other country has closed its border completely 100 percent sealed their border off from people coming in i mean maybe some of these small countries i think there's a there's a maybe some small country somewhere is doing that but uh, for a major power to do that with countries with giant borders and orders of population of over a billion for China and hundreds of millions of population, you know, 150 million population for Russia, whatever it is. This is a extraordinary. These are extraordinary measures. And they are pre-war measures. Any military analyst looks at it, they're going, what are they thinking? What is going on here? Also to prevent the outside world from seeing what's going on inside of Russia. Now, the very fact that within the last week, the U.S. has taken these uh, basically, frankly, nuclear war measures of prepar level of preparations that uh, indicates the U.S. is seeing things with their satellites that uh, we're not being told. They're seeing some kind of preparation over there that is increased, our ready it, it causing our readiness levels to be increased. Sure. Um, Yes, and we also see that the, that the propaganda war is, is 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 heightened because we see that. The Chinese, they, they, they blame the United States for unleashing this virus. And, uh, and also Russia is, I don't know, I, I have not studied yet. Russia is quite torn. It, it has acted much better than China, I would say, in regards to they send uh, many uh, medical equipment to the United States and to Italy and so on. So they acted a little bit more humane, I would say, in, in, in comparison. Um, but... It, it, but what I want to discuss, this is a perfect uh, topic, is that many people within the alternative media circles, they are wondering what kind of geopolitical implications would this have? Well, obviously, your, your thesis is that, that we are heading towards a war. Other people, they say that what we are experiencing right now is a consolidation of power from the globalist. And they mean that this new political order of globalization is being manifested through global surveillance, that we are being having a supranational surveillance regime that will monitor citizens and that will actually decrease uh, democratic forces all over the world. What would your response be to this? Well, I, I think we definitely have to be careful about... Um... The possibility that uh, you know this idea of of chipping human beings and uh, surveilling us, surveilling all people, uh, we have to be careful that uh, some kind of social monitoring, social uh, control system is not placed on us, um, because that that would be very negative. We we really can't at this time trust everybody that's in the governments of Western Europe, in the United States, and Canada. We we can't trust them because. Uh, you, we have people with very strange agendas who want to have society more regimented. They want to move us towards a totalitarian end of the spectrum. And I think one of the things about war and the threat of a, bi of, of a biological weapon like this one is that it, it, it brings about a change in consciousness and thinking of people. And that change in consciousness uh, is, is going to clarify things for people. And um, the, the clarity that comes from that is it, it might be a more of appreciation of the nation state as the effective actor of, of these things. And, um, and I think that the globalist kind of intervention we are seeing, when you look at the World Health Organization, you know, there are calls for the World Health Organization to be investigated now. And um, because the World Health Organization was saying when there was reason to know otherwise that this virus could not go human to human. Why did they do that? You got this, this guy that was heading it. He's not even a doctor. He's, he's some kind of communist. Well, what, what was his agenda? Was he working for the Chinese? Was this part of getting the rest of the world to, to take a swallow a strong dose of this virus to, to, to poison us? I mean, and, and there is this, you know, I, I've, I've mentioned Carl, Carl Schmidt before in the concept of the political that it's mm -hmm. very important to know who your enemies are and know who your friends are in the political sense. And, um, and in this kind of situation, we see, the world sees, that China has these, its leadership, not the Chinese people, but its leadership has this malignancy, or it is a malignancy. It has very hostile intentions. We, we heard, the, I don't know if you heard this about the G20 meeting, 
that Xi Jinping basically was dictating to the other world leaders saying, you are going to accept our goods, you are going to take dictate from us on trade, and if you don't, we're going to cut you off from your pharmaceuticals because we make your high blood pressure medication, we make your antibiotics, and I mean, imagine, imagine a leader threatening other leaders to cut them off of medicine that mm. keeps many of their citizens alive. And I think I think that this this should serve as a valuable lesson for our elite that we should never let the economic conditions, uh, let's say, shape our political situations. Because what happened was that the capitalist elites connected to various types of financial institutions, uh, they have all been in favor of, let's say, that the global supply chain is centered on or in and around China. And this has meant loss of labor for, for us Europeans and also for North Americans. And also, uh, 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 unless uh, a not so good living standard for us, whereas the Chinese have, has, have been able to prosper from that. And they are in control of the global supply chain, like Jeff just mentioned, with medical equipment and so on. And this is very dangerous when a world leader from a country that aspires for global domination, you know, says, uh, acts in such a way. Yes. Yeah, well, how can we trust our uh, economic leaders, these globalists, how can we trust their judgment when they have made such a catastrophic blunder mm. as, to, as to have made, got into bed because of the low labor costs for, for having China manufacture everything, they basically handed China a weapon by which China could then force globalism in on its terms. That is globalization with Chinese characteristics, so to speak. And and that they all fell into this this trap. They all they all did this. I, I mean, uh, when you consider this, uh, then people realize: well, if we had had national leaders, they certainly wouldn't have done this. They would have been looking out for our people. These globalists weren't looking out for anybody. They were thinking, oh, we're one happy village. We're all going to cooperate together. We're all going to work together. It's nonsense. The Chinese were out for themselves. The Chinese communists were out to dominate the world. They were using the whole process of globalization as a double-edged sword. And now they're sticking that sword right against our throat and saying, you have to do what we say now or we're going to pull the plug on you. I mean, mm. when so many things yeah, are manufactured, I mean, we're going to not have toilet paper to wipe our butts because it's made in China now, right? Uh, and, 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 exactly. And this from an economic point of view in regards to, let's say, the labor uh, and the living standard for us Europeans and Americans has been only not has been bad because the only thing that that Europeans, let's say, have prospered from is this shopping mall consumerism that we shop goods and so on that are made in China. And this, this is totally punctuated now this, because now it's going to go. I mean, it has been restrained due to this virus. But I, I would just want to make a quick point that that the Western conception of globalization is connected to the free movement of, let's say, people, capital, goods and services. So now we see that the free movement of people, it has been restrained. Capital is still global and goods are still global and services also punctuated, not that active anymore. But what we notice is that we see a much greater, let's say, surveillance. And this, like Jeff said, we have to, we have to study what kind of consequences this will have because in a, in a state of war, in a state of a crisis, it's always the civil liberties that get that get restrained. And this is something that we absolutely need to take into consideration because we have to study what our elites, our globalists are planning. Are they le really working to create a new surveillance regime and monitor us with Chinese characteristics? Uh, I mean, it, it, it is a very dangerous situation where we're heading towards. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, and this is why there has to be a sorting out we have to sort this out. There are going to be people who were on the wrong side of this, you know, before the crisis that are going to change their mind and they're going to see the light. But there's going to be people who have always been in, in bed with the Chinese, have taken their money, 
have have advanced Chinese interests. And these people, I mean, look, at the beginning of World War II, you know, Oswald uh, Mosley and his, uh, his British fascists were rounded up and put in, put in a camp, basically, because they were pro-Mussolini and pro-Hitler. And so when the World War II started, they weren't, those people weren't going to be allowed to walk around. I mean, Oswald Mosley was an influential member of parliament at one time. And uh, so they, they put him under arrest, basically, during the length of the war. So the same mm -hmm. thing, we've got people who are basically have served China's interests. And when China becomes, this is the significance of war, when China becomes the enemy of the West, not just the United States, but Europe too, all of those people that serve the Chinese interests, they need to be uh, basically put in some kind of uh, camp where they can't exercise their use of their money their interest, and you say, well, that's against civil liberties. Hey, wait a minute, we're at war. People have to understand, in, in, in peacetime, you want freedom, you want free markets, you want freedom of speech. In a war, you're going to let somebody come out and, and give the enemy's version of events on your TV during a war and confuse the heck out of your population and disorient everybody? That is not allowed by any country that wants to survive in a war. Oh. Uh, yes, that's a very good point. Now, 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 what I want to, uh, that's a very perfect discussion because uh, let's say, I, w I want to divide this because this is very important. Okay, let's, let's focus a little bit about what kind of uh, restructuring geopolitically are we seeing in world affairs and the conditions in order to this to happen. I would say that economic history tells us whenever there is a huge economic crisis, or let's say that the markets are totally in, in decline, where well, there we see a new political power being manifested, and it usually happens through wars, through very severe crises. For instance, if, if the markets will uh, you know, go down, because, we, I mean, many people, and I see this, we are heading towards an economic decline, a financial collapse, that might even be of greater magnitude than the one we experienced in September of 2008. Now, if this happens, obviously we will see um, it will it will spark off a huge security competition between the great powers. And this is something that I want to ask you: Do you see this happening? Obviously, you have mentioned it, but I want to hear your. I want to get your take about a, a, a let's say a forecast. Well, uh, I think what's there's, there's a lot of uh, high-pressure diplomacy going on behind the scenes right now. You can bet on that. And mm -hmm. one of the things is, is that, you, that Europe is undoubtedly very nervous about is that is Russia going to align with China or is it going to stay neutral or is it going to align with, with the West in this? And this is a, this is a, a really important moment because, because Russia's commitment to China as a military ally, look, they had in... 2018, they had this uh, Vostok exercise uh, where they practiced the invading Alaska, right? China and Russia. That's really what it was, the biggest military exercise in all of history. And it was, an, it was basically a practice invasion of Alaska with, uh, I, I believe there were, uh, was a nuclear component in it. Um, so so uh, uh, what is Russia going to uphold its military uh, cooperation with China, or is it going to step away from that? Now, everything, what has really alarmed Europe is the fact that the Russian bots, you know, the internet propaganda from Russia has been uh, basically in collusion with China and Chinese propaganda and trying to make the effect of the virus, the effect of the biological weapon more powerful than it would, spreading disinformation about the virus. They've been caught. The Russians have been caught red-handed doing this. So basically, what, what, what happens before a war is that you basically cut off your enemy from your trade. The way the West has always waged war is to cut them off and to blockade them. The problem with the blockade strategy is China is our supply chain. We're blockading ourselves. And uh, uh, Eurasia, uh, you know, Ru Russia and China sure. together 
and their allies, North Korea, Vietnam, uh, you know, uh, Pakistan, probably. Those allies are probably so, so such a large area of the world that they have tremendous economic uh, stamina to withstand uh, being cut off from the West. How long? I don't know. And, and the West is going to suffer very severe economic dislocations from this because I think this crisis is going to continue throughout the month. And it's by the end of the month, it's going to we're going to know one way or the other whether this is headed towards a, a larger war or not. Sure. Um, and also uh, economically, if we, we say we, we had a forecasting from, let's say, financial firms like a GP Morgan Chase, and they say by by July that we will experience our worldwide recession. That will and they and they mean that they, it will affect all of us. Every country that is somehow connected to this global market. Now, now I'm willing to agree what you say that the Chinese actually do have control of their global supply chain, and this has put us in a very vulnerable situation, both both for Europe and the United States. However, what needs to be, what I want to, any anyone who is new to me in here, I have also, I, I always said that the, I, I am very keen on presenting a holistic framework where we can analyze geopolitical and economic events from various sorts of angles so we can get a better understanding. Now, of course, we see the Chinese, they're very strong, both in regards to the economy and both in regards to the military. But we have to also study those financial oligarch families that I have mentioned in the past, such as the Barburi, the Rothschilds, the Lazard, and their tentacles of power, how they can utilize power through various big financial institutions, like, for instance, like J.P. Morgan Chase, like the Goldman Sachs, uh, and, and many more. So, uh, and, and what will happen? Will they consolidate more power? Will we see that they will, uh, let's say, monopolize the markets much more? Let's say, will we see a consolidation of power from their behalf? Or will we see that, that they will suffer too? What would you say to the, the, this that I raised, please? I think that this is going to be, you know, if you look at World War One and World War Two, of course, the capitalists and financial powers, you know, in World War One they shut down the stock markets. Uh, toward, you know, in 1914, uh, I think, uh, but then everything, everybody was there. They all cooperated in the war economies. Uh, they all threw their shoulders. To, and then when the war was over, the, the same economic actors came forward again and the market started up again. This may be similar, but there could be differences because this is much more political. The errors and the missteps and the wrong things that were done beforehand uh -huh. And the possible loss of life here, because we're talking about, you know, this, I think this pandemic is just the beginning. I think there's going to be a lot of loss of life, unfortunately, because you're talking about a, a war that's going to probably involve the Middle East, the Far East. It could involve North America and Alaska. It could involve Europe if Russia joins the Chinese. Mm -hmm. So you could you could end up in a, in a World War Three situation where you are, you know, where nuclear weapons are ultimately being used to, on some scale, we don't know on what scale, and certainly biological weapons have already been used in more uh, uh, nasty iterations of biological weapons. So, and you're, you're, when you disrupt the, the supply chain, the balance of power has already shifted in favor of Russia and China because of the way things are playing out now. The West, Western economies are in free fall, they're losing enormous amounts of money. The, the China seems better prepared. Russia seems better prepared for this, as if they knew what they, they know what they're doing. They've thought this out already. Um, China is, uh, this is it. People say, oh, China wouldn't wreck its own system. No, I think you're looking at it wrong. Okay, we have 21 million fewer Chinese cell phone users, which some people are interpreting to say 21 million Chinese have died in this so far. They're just hiding this number. It's, That's it's a just fantastic horrible. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic thing. But you yeah, know, but you, I, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yes, yeah. When but when you look at you look at for example in Italy what the average age of the dead people dying is 81 years old. Uh, at least it was a couple of weeks back or a week back or so. Uh, who knows what it is now, but but uh, if you look at this China's one child policy left it with this aging population after half a century. And so you have to say are they purposely killing off their old and infirm in advance of a war? Because when you look at the, the rumors that the Chinese government has created 
these I, this idea that that the elderly go to the hospital and they put them in body bags and cremate them alive. I saw that. that. Not... I saw that. I saw that, and and it was questionable where whether it was real or fake. But the, I mean, the, the video it it was so chilling. It, right. it really haunted me. And and, and I, I mean, it's it's it's, it's yeah horrible. But, but you Please, see, the yeah. thing is, is this thing is being allowed on the Chinese internet. Is this mm -hmm. is this uh, a propaganda campaign by the Chinese Communist government to get old people to stay at home and die at home? So their hospitals is the reason the Chinese hospitals are no longer being flooded the way they were initially because they've created this this information campaign that has persuaded the elderly and the dying to die at home. Is that what's really happened in China that they only have to go around and pick up and burn the bodies? But Jeff, so according if, if I get your take now, we live in a situation where great powers compete with each other. We are still miles away from having a world government. We do have some kind of, let's say, we, we know that the powers that be, that they are really keen on creating a surveillance regime and, and let's say limiting democratic activities, limiting democratic political gatherings and so on, especially at this very moment. Yes. But I want to ask, but I want to ask you, so your take would be that we see that, that the Chinese and the Russians are going together and preparing some kind of a military operation, at least from the Chinese vantage point. Is that correct? It does, it does seem that they're preparing a military operation, and I think they're, they're focused on the United States and possibly the Middle East, because if they get control of the Middle East oil, they can force Japan and Europe to do what they want. And if they neutralize the United States as a great power, then Europe and Japan will be defenseless against military attacks. So they would have both a military blackmail and they would also have economic blackmail against Japan and, and Western Europe. Uh, this is a perfect because a countryman uh, from my country, uh, Sir Nalegia is his uh, YouTube name. A big shout out to him. I hope he's listening. Uh, he's a very big fan of you, yours too, Jeff. So. Uh, but he asked me, and he, he asked me, he wanted to get your take. He obviously knows mine, but he wanted to get your take. If, like you mentioned, that they're preparing some kind of attack against the U.S. and also that they want to secure the oil fields in the Middle East, because then China naturally will have much more control over the energy supply and consumes a hell of a lot of energy, at least it did prior to, to, to this coronavirus. Now, my subscriber, he, he, he wanted to get your take. How would you say Israel, uh, what will be Isra Israel's role in this current, let's say, conflict? Go ahead, Chef. First, I want to get your take. Well, Israel, of course, is the whipping boy of Iran in unifying the Muslims in the Middle East and trying to get them to, to go to war. <clears throat> the real target globally is the United States. But Israel is the immediate cause that motivates the the animus and the, and the warlike hatred of uh, the Muslim, the Arab, and the Iranian peoples, all the peoples that, you know, share this common uh, dislike for the fact that there's this, is you know, this uh, Jewish state, or they call it the Jewish entity in the Middle East. So this is something that they can use to rally people. Uh, but their real aim is the oil. That's the strategic thing that they want. Israel is not really strategic, except that it is a, you know, a... a like I say, a whipping boy, a way to motivate people to fight. Uh, I think that Israel is in a, in, a, in a militarily untenable position if the United States comes under attack and Europe is threatened. Because who is, who is going to have the resources to try to protect Israel in this situation? The, the United States is going to try to protect the oil, not Israel. Israel's on its own. I, I want, yeah, I want to get, uh, now you got the Jeff's take, and now I want to give briefly my take on this. Uh, I, I, I would say that what we will see in, in every time when econo e economies decline, we see a political crisis, and then we see new political manifestations. That is, we see new, new power centers emerge, and we also see new alliances emerge. And I would say that the intelligentsia in Israel connected to the Likud strategies, they're very aware of this. They have monitored China for a very long time. And, and it has happened, it is corroborated, 
that that um, Israel has sold nuclear technology information from the United States to the Chinese. They have done so. This is this is a fact. And they have always maintained good relations with China, despite the fact that the Chinese are with the Iranians and so are the Russians. But, but nevertheless, Chinese simply adore uh, Jewish people. Let's say there is a saying that the Chinese in, in Singapore Yeah, I I lost you for a second yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, no. Did you know that the Chinese, let's say in other uh, countries in Southeast Asia, and so on, they're regarded as very productive. They are even called the Jews of the Far East. Did oh, you yeah. know that? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Of course, yeah. They're, they, they, but they, the Chinese have some similar uh, characteristics in their diaspora in in Southeast Asia and the islands. Because what 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 I wanted to say is like I just want to answer this very fast. We will see new alliances being Are you there, shaped. Rudolph? Yeah, I'm I'm here. Do you hear me? Yeah, we're just losing the connection a little bit. Yeah. Uh, okay. Wait. Yeah. Well, I just want to say that in, in in such a crisis that we will probably see new alliances emerge, and mm -hmm. I believe that Chinese. And the Russians, they have very good ties with Israel. So I believe that is that that Israel will be somehow able to balance both the West and the East in order to maximize its situation is as best as it possibly can. So that's my take. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it it's possible. Um, it it could happen that way. It could also happen that uh, Iran and Israel will get into some kind of nuclear exchange. Um, I do believe that Iran has nuclear weapons. Israel, we know, has nuclear weapons. And uh, the hatred there is is so palpable. Um, and, and I think that the Chinese and Russians don't really have any real great love for the Iranian people. They're using Iran. Iran is their cat's paw to cause trouble. So That's we'll have to see how it comes out. I know, I know there's an American military... Um, expert who is a very high level uh, strategic American strategic thinker. He he made the battle plan for the invasion of Iraq, and uh, he told me that the Iranians, as military men, are very capable. That Iran is is uh, he has a very high opinion of the Iranian uh, military, and that it was much more effective than the Israeli military, which kind of shocked me. Uh, and this guy well, is, a, is one of the top military also, analysts in the United States, yeah. I'm also very surprised of this, considering the enormous, uh, let's say, economic and military aid that, that Israel receives from the United States. So, yes. Well, of course, that, that aid is matched to Egypt. Egypt also receives the military aid as part of the, the agreement that settled the uh, demilitarized the Sinai. Um, so I think I, I sure, I think but it received is, more is that, than yeah. Iran. It it, yeah. it it received more than Iran. Yeah, I mean Iran has had sanctions in 1979. Right. Well, yeah, no, but I mean, you know, we the peace that was made was between Egypt and Israel, not Iran and Israel. The United no, no, States. Sure, sure. The United States is yeah. The United States is at odds with Iran. Iran is allied with Beijing and Moscow, and uh, Iran's real target whatever they do in terms of the psychological warfare is Israel is their target. The real target is Saudi Arabia. The real target are the Gulf states. And to dominate that oil will make uh, Iran a kind of superpower if they can get hold of that oil. And um, so, yeah, I just wanted to make a, this is very important what you said now, because this is the economic, let's say, conditions are so much tied into geopolitics. I just have to tell you this. Uh, yeah. The reason w w w also why it's not only due to the coronavirus, why the oil prices have plummeted, you know, OK, they have now the oil has gone up a little bit, but it's mostly also that, let's say, Saudi Arabia together with Russia, you know, uh, they they continue to produce the enormous amount of oil for such a cheap price, despite the fact that the markets indicates that it's not necessary. So we see an oversupply of oil 
and this has threatened many, and this is a, a, a warfare being raised. So I would say that Riyadh has not even been an exemplary ally of the United States either, I would say. This is just look at that from the economic point. What would you say about that? It's a very curious move that the Saudis did, and I don't really understand why they did it. It appears to be an attack on the U.S. oil industry infrastructure. And it appears yeah. that the Russians, yeah, although some people said it was an attack on Russia because they were right. You see, right at the moment when Russia relies on oil exports to float its military system, they did this. So it could it could have been uh, an attack on Russia's ability to finance its military. So it's it's difficult to really read it because it hurts the U.S., oil industry, uh, you know, the fracking, uh, which requires uh, like, I think, yeah. $35, $40 a barrel oil in order to maintain itself is financially viable, right? Is that your understanding? Absolutely yeah. correct. 30, $35, $40 per barrel is what they need to just go around to be floating. Yes. Otherwise, they will, right. yeah, otherwise, they will go bankrupt. Yeah. So, But, but yeah. this is very interesting. Now, of course, like you said, we have the facts and now it's, now it's up to make the opinions and, it, uh, and to, to interpret the facts. But what we notice is very interesting. Did you notice that, that Riyadh and Tehran, they made some kind of reapproachment? after this general was wiped out, you know, Qasem Soleimani, they somehow tried to normalize the relations. And then all of a sudden, it just, you know, they continue with the production of oil despite the market indicators. Now, okay, you can make the case, but I'm very worried that, that it was somehow a deliberate attack against the United States. See, that's my interpretation, but... It's very difficult to 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 get a it's, it's difficult to read it. Yeah. The, now, what's really interesting is that Putin doubled down unexpectedly once Russia once Russia saw that what the, the Saudis were doing, the Russians joined in and did it, too, which is really scary. It's almost like Putin's, you know, like saying, oh, you want to play this game? I can play it better than you is very strange flooding the, the market. And of course, it, it has caused damage. I've heard from people in the oil industry here. I uh, uh, chatted with a guy uh, who said he and his entire uh, team got laid off in, in an oil thing in the Midwest here somewhere. Uh, there's, sure. there's, there's a massive, and of course, Canada is being hit by this too. Um, of course. Every oil see. producing country. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, and of course, exactly. one of the headlines is that, you know, Russia screws Venezuela, right? Russia screws its oil allies um, because, you know, Venezuela is hurting really bad. I mean, the only thing keeping people eating in Venezuela is their oil exports. Um, Absolutely. And, that's, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and of course, there's this very here's an interesting military aside. You saw that the U.S., uh, is going down with its fleet and it's going to attack the drug dealers down in the Caribbean, right? Yes, 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 I saw that. Yeah, well, you know, it, being a being a sort of, sort of student of military history, it has to pass through your mind that this is mm -hmm. a stalking horse for an attack on Venezuela. Mm -hmm. That the U.S. is planning to flip that regime um, because if we've mobilized a million reserves, do we go... Now the U.S. has the, the manpower to go after Venezuela. Is that what's going to happen? We're going after Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua at the outset of a war? Because you see, if we are going to war against China, China's got bases in those countries. China's got military personnel in Venezuela and Cuba. So we come down there and we take those countries as the first step. That would be logically to clean up our own backyard. So, you know, you got to uh, see this that, naval... But... Yeah. You also secure the oil fields over there. So in case of an economic disruption, there you go. That yeah. magnitude, you have the control of that. It's, it's yeah. classical geo textbook geopolitics. Yes. Right. It's classical textbook. And so you say, really, the U.S. Navy, they're sending an admiral down there to take care of drug traffickers in the Caribbean? Wait a minute. Is this just staging the fleet forward? To go to do something to Venezuela to land troops and in, in what's going on there? What what kind of move do, is this really? Because when you look at military moves in early phases of a war, many of the moves are uh, diversionary or they misrepresent themselves as something they're not in order to set up an attack. And surprise in war is a very important element. So I, I want to introduce that idea uh, because. 
obviously, when you if you if you going to if the United States is going to go to war against this block of countries, the Beijing Moscow block, um, uh, the most vulnerable members of that block are Nicaragua, Cuba, Venezuela, whereas our more vulnerable allies would be South Korea, Taiwan, mm. Japan. The Philippines are probably not our ally anymore. Uh, Thailand, places like that. Um, I think I think that would be in, in case of a uh, let's say in case of a war with China and so on. I think it would be a very good move to take over Venezuela in regards to what I just mentioned about securing the oil fields. In yeah. Case because it, because yeah. yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and I just to, to mention, if this is the way it plays out, you know, you see these these low oil prices now. By June, July, you're going to see oil going through the, you're going to see $150, $200, $300 a barrel oil, you know, because you, because once you have a war that erupts, first of all, the Strait of Hormuz closes in the Middle oh, East course. if there's a war there. Well, sky uh, rocket, and, yeah. And then, yeah, and if Venezuela, you know they're going to torch the oil fields in Venezuela if the U.S. is at war with Venezuela. So you so know for that there's going to be an interruption, yeah. So, so for listeners listening to this, in case that we see a crisis happening and we see that the U.S. prepare for an attack on investing in oil on a long market, that the market will go up. Right, <laughs> yes. And in yeah. fact, you know, then that's a bit of a gamble. But I would say, you know, with oil prices being low, oil futures, it's like, you know, I'm thinking maybe this is going to turn around. This is going to, this is going to end up being really expensive. Because yeah. it really does look. I mean, if I if somebody put a gun to my head and said, "All right, you got to call it Nyquist. You got to say whether it's a war or peace." Right uh -huh. now, I'd say it's going to be a war. Uh, you know, you it's know. very frightening with the tensions and with the, with, with the sparking up of this this competition and how we see how the Chinese have acted. You know their their behavior and also the rhetoric that they use. It's very harsh. It's very aggressive tone. So this is something mm -hmm. that we, we so so it, the, the way I, I I could never understand as a European patriot. I can never understand how there are patriots in the United States and in other countries who are cheering for China. You know they they they're happy because oh China is a homogeneous country. So that's why. But 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 I mean I mean hmm. there are many countries, non-Western countries, that are homogeneous. But that does not mean that I am a, in favor of their regime. So so I never understood this because China, they have they are controlling the global supply chains. They're acting like power influencer in world affairs. They're they're dictating our conditions. And our living standards has decreased, and they have increased their living conditions on behalf of ours. So why should we support China as patriots? It does not make any sense whatsoever. Please go ahead. Well, I, I and this is this goes to this issue of all these people that have taken money from China, all of these people who have uh, have done China's bidding. Look, you have all these labs that are coming out and saying, we've looked at the RNA of. And it's not an engineered weapon. These all, if you look at every one of these groups, they've taken money from China. And when you look at the Indian study or you look at uh, 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 various people who've independently come forward, physicians and people who know, know how to read the RNA, they're saying, no, this thing is an engineered virus. This thing is manufactured. Mm. So. Absolutely, absolutely. And if you look at for the European condition, I want to mention this because another uh, another subscriber of mine, he asked me, could you cover a little bit about Turkey? And this is very good because in, in regards to, I mean, when we saw the border disputes between, let's say, Greece and Turkey, and they let all those migrants flood into Greece, you know, and then all of a sudden they, they, they resorted to some kind of a blackmail, especially Erdogan vis-a-vis -vis the European Union, if you don't pay us, if you don't help us and so on, we will unleash these hordes of Arabs. So they have maybe three, 3.5 million Arabs within their territories. So they threaten all the time to unleash these hordes on us. So, and and Turkey is in, is I, I would label Turkey as a strong regional power. And I, I would say that Turkey, how it has acted, it has nothing to do within NATO anymore. I mean, it should be kicked out of NATO for its behavior. What would you say, Jeff, about this? Well, Turkey is the strongest conventional power in NATO outside of the U.S. 
They have the most armored fighting vehicles. They have the most artillery. They have the largest potential mobilized army. Uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly the latest on France. France can put together large forces, but I don't think the French are ready. And I think the French have problems with their conventional military. But the, the, the uh, Turks are thought to have a very efficient military. And they're, they're, they have a tradition of being very good on the battlefield. Yeah. So I think Turkey is a very important country, and, and you don't want to alienate them if you don't. They're natural enemies of the Russians. I agree. That's something to, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, I think Erdogan is, is, is an extremely irresponsible leader. There's something yeah, terribly I, wrong with him. I, I just want to say something. This is very important. Uh, um, you, um, I want to say like this, that I'm not blaming the Turkish people for, for this, what happened. I'm blaming Erdogan because he's so opportunistic and he's a power, he, he, he wants to just consolidate power as much as yeah. he can. But he's, the, he's clearly the, power mad, yes. Yeah, the best ideals, the, the worst scenario for us in Europe would be <clears throat> if Islamic fundamentalists take over Turkey, because then on the one hand, they would unleash these Arabs into our territories, but also we would be faced with a very dangerous enemy that is totally militarized and fundamentalist. So I am actually in support of secularized Turkish nationalists, so they can just, you know, contain these migrants and create a safe zone for them so they do not enter Europe. On, and then so we can have good time with Turkey because it is a strategic partner. Let's say it has a geopolitical and cultural interest in the Caucasus and in Central Asia. So it can act as a bulwark against the Chinese-Russian alliance. So that's what I wanted to say, yes. Yeah, well, war is always a dividing up. So, for example, when World War II began, you had Poland and Germany going to war and Britain and France dividing up against Germany and joining Poland. And, of course, the Soviet Union tilting towards Germany and economically helping Germany at the beginning of the war. So you have the, everybody divides up. And just like I said before about Russia, with China going against the United States with this biological attack on the world and destroying the Western markets, Russia has this choice. Are they going to go with the Chinese? Or are they going to stay neutral? And, and Turkey, just like Russia, has this choice. And I, I can tell you this. If Russia goes with Ch China, Turkey will be under enormous pressure from the Chinese and the Russians, economically from the Chinese and, and, and politically, militarily from the Russians and the Iranians, to join that, that alliance and say, all right, you're not really Western. They're never going to accept you as Western, just like they're never going to accept Russia as wholly Western. We're too Asiatic. We need to go to war against these people. We need to dominate. Here, you can dominate your sphere of influence. We can dominate our, you know, Europe or whatever. So it, there is the possibility that Erdogan, having these, being an ambitious leader, being a kind of Turkish Mussolini, you might say, uh, is going to join up with this, with Moscow, and and, I, I, and they're going to team up. It's possible. I wouldn't be surprised, but I think because I, I think it was in July that Russians sold, you know, enormous amount of you know weaponry to to Turkey and so on. So they have under the radar, especially after the crisis in Syria, 2015. They have cooperated a lot, apart from what happened these a few weeks ago in Idlib in Syria now, but on, on the one hand, we see a tension on a, a micro, micro conflict between them in Syria, like through the proxy forces, but geopolitically, like you said, Jeff, I'm willing to take, uh, to take your side on this, that if, this, if Erdogan remains in power, which is most likely he has consolidated enormous amount of power, he will probably join the Russian and the Chinese against, against us. I think yeah, that, he, that might he, be a scenario. Yeah, he showed this inclination as he's tipped against the United States. You know, when when that uh, crazy, very mysterious uh, coup against him uh, collapsed, yes. he blamed Obama. He blamed the United States, which is very strange because we didn't have anything to do with it. Um, but it yeah, was it, it was, was a political. It's just yeah. yeah. And, and no, it was, it was just, questionable if it was a genuine uprising or if yes. it was some kind of a false flag in order for Erdogan to just consolidate power. We yeah, don't know it, yet. 
it looks like it might have been a purge for him to consolidate power. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think you and I, we both, I've talked to, I, I had a long discussion because I did some research on Turkey this last summer. I had a long discussion with a, a Turkish researcher, and that was her opinion. She thought that it, the whole thing was was a, uh, you know, fake news, so to speak, just so he could get at his enemies and, and cleanse the military. Exactly. And it, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but it's, it's, it's a very... I mean, we see the indicators for a war. Let's hope that they are able still that, uh, let's say, that rational the decisions, they still, let's say, prevail. So we don't see now when, when it's a sharp tension between these countries, something happen because it might, you know, spread like this virus, a war like that. And this would be detrimental for us, for everyone. War, I would war say. is always tragic. Uh, wars recur. We know this in history. The idea that people had that Francis Fukuyama had in his disgusting book, The End of History, that we're not going to have wars anymore is so silly and so childish that it's 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 shameful that a that a scholar a person with a PhD in front of their name would even come up with it, but we're going to see now I do believe uh, that that is a completely false thesis that the world if we do not end up in a war we're coming so close as to show that it's it's always possible and it's in some sense it's inevitably going to happen at some point or or that we will see let's say we we saw. Uh, Many many examples of asymmetrical conflicts. Let's say a, a a great power fighting, let's say proxy wars against a minor state or against some groups and so on. They're connected to another state that don't have nuclear weapons. That we will definitely see more conflicts and crises because oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and, well, we've been we, in we've been in an asymmetrical war with China for thirty years. We just haven't uh, we haven't admitted it to ourselves. Sure. Sure. But also what we need to, so if we sum this up a little bit, so we see that the, sh the tone being much sharper between the two great powers, United States and China, we see also that the governments in the West are resorting to some kind of surveillance regime that they want to monitor us uh, in, due to this virus that is spreading and it is really something that we need to take into consideration because we see what happened in Spain, in Italy and now it's hitting you know United States quite hard and it has reached Sweden also it keeps spreading more and more and also we discussed also about the economic condition what might happen so I think we covered it quite well. Is there, I mean, it was a very interesting discussion. Is there anything more you would like to add to this, Jeff? Well, there's, there's one little, mm -hmm. I told you so, I can't resist. Um, oh, please over do. The last 20, over the last 20 years and, and my appearances on radio, especially, and, and doing podcasts, uh, I have been reproached with the absurdity of my view that war with China and the United between China and the United States is inevitable because of course China and the United States are trading partners and they have this tremendous interest in getting along and trading and making money off of each other and I would always point to them you know that you could say about well, Britain and Germany before 1914 Jeff yeah can you hear me can you hear me okay are you there we're just about losing it, I think. If you can't hear me, I'm trying to talk. Yeah, let me know if you can.